Hello, St. Michael's. This is Reverend Michelle with a brief overview for Lesson 6 of our study of Amos and Hosea, Lesson on Baal, the Canaanite agricultural god. Some people say Baal, um, and the Baalization of worship, as the chapter heading goes. Or another way to say all of that is how we are always trying to conflate the worship of God with our own needs. As I read through the participant packet this week, which has been quite a, and a great resource all the way through the study, I realized that most of what I wanted to offer this week to prepare you is already well addressed by the author, George Ramsey. In particular, how interwoven the relationship of Baal was to these people. Keep in mind that the 12 tribes of Israel invaded Canaan in the 13th century BCE, this was led by Joshua, the successor to Moses. And this is where the stories about Jericho come from in the book of Joshua. And from a biblical scholarship perspective, that is the beginning of Israel's history. For example, when we studied the Hebrew scriptures in the seminary, we started not with Genesis, but with the book of Joshua, so that we understood the historical context of all Hebrew scripture. Now, if we extrapolate this to our own context, which is quite easy, the U.S. is a result of the same kind of behavior of foreign people invading a land and claiming it as their own. So, of course, the Canaanite people were still in the land. And, of course, Canaanite religion was still being practiced, maybe or maybe not, by Israelites as well as Canaanites, even though the Israelites claimed Yahweh as their God. Which leads me to another aspect of this that I'd like to highlight. People did not believe in one God the way we think of monotheism today. We believe that God is God and that all religions essentially worship God, who is God. Rather, they believed in national gods, the God of the people, the God of the place. This is true of Yahweh the God of Israel. Yahweh was the God of a certain people. We know this from scripture and how often phrases like, I will be your God and you will be my people are scattered through scripture. But Yahweh was not the God of a certain place because the 12 tribes were wanderers. They understood themselves as descendants of Abraham. And it was Abraham who first wandered and discovered God is not bound to a place. This happens in Genesis chapter 12, when his name was still Abram. And God said to Abram, this is from scripture, God said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And Abram journeys to Shechem, to the oak of Morah, and builds an altar to God. And then he went to the land near Bethel and built an altar there. And God told him, I will make you, of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. Remember, this is what we're talking about when we talk about what the elect is. You will be my people. I will be your God. You will be a blessing. And what that means is then we shall be a blessing, a way of, of people understanding God through justice and love. He says, I will bless you. God, this is God. I will bless you. I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse and in, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. But even though Abraham found that God was not bound to a place, notice that through this story, God is telling Abram, Abraham, again Abram at this point, that God wants a place to be claimed in the name of Yahweh, which reinforces the notion that God is a God of place, a God of people. But is that more the desire of the people, or is that actually about God's desire for them? It's a good question here, because now we see the consistent theme in our worship of God that occurs throughout all ages, that we believe that God is here to provide things for us, so much so that we project our own desires onto God all the time. Because if we truly believe in God as the ultimate, almighty, infinite, life-giving, ground of all being, God of love, then we have to wonder about our own desires. 
And we certainly have to question any kind of belief that God is on the side of empire, especially in light of what we have come to know about God's love made known in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, who we call our Savior, the Christ, who is God incarnate. So to turn God into some sort of candy machine is problematic at best, blasphemous at worst. All of this is context for this week's lesson and understanding what it means when we conflate God with prosperity or blessing. It's not that God wants us to suffer or doesn't care when we do, but we do suffer because we're finite creatures. Yet because of Jesus, we know that God is with us in our suffering. And is that which calls us back again and again to love and justice and truth despite our suffering. So to bring this back to our own context, that the people of Israel conflated their worship of Yahweh with the Canaanite god Baal is not far from our practices here in the U.S. As Ramsey infers in the participant packet in his writing for this week's lesson, making offerings to Baal is not all that different from paying insurance premiums, for example, or investing in the stock market. Does the fact that we don't call these practices worship mean that they are not a form of worship anyway, even for people who are practitioners of religion like ourselves? It's an interesting thing to consider in this week's lesson. Who are we worshiping? How are we worshiping? And what does that mean for who we are? Do we actually rely on God for our salvation? Now, as you can see, I'm not coming to you from any kind of chapel or, or, or church. I'm coming to you from my home office. Um, and I want to make sure that you are taking care of yourself this week. I know it's a challenging week for everyone, and I'd like you to ask you to take time to check in with one another, to reach out and let others know that we are with each other as we move through this time. I hope you'll consider joining us for the Election Eve Vigil, in person or online. It's a three-hour drop-in vigil from 6 to 9 on Monday night. So come when you can and be with us for as long as you can. Look for information about that in today's Looking Ahead that will come in your email. And please also consider coming for evening prayer on Tuesday. This will be a chance to get away from the news by coming to the sanctuary to pray together as a community. The service will not be offered online so that we can all be encouraged to make the effort to be together in person, incarnate. And finally, the day after the election on Wednesday, you are encouraged to join the diocesan community at our Cathedral of St. John the Divine for a vigil for the healing of the world from 7 to 8. It's an interfaith service that will be both in person and broadcast online via the cathedral's website and YouTube page. But in all of these coming days, I think really the most important thing you can do is to be sure to join your small group for Bible study. Your presence is so important to others in the group, even if you think it's not. As always, I hope to see you on Sunday as we baptize a new little one into the body of Christ. Until then, bye for now.